Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mike Swetnam, and I'm the CEO and chairman of the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. We're a not-for-profit think tank in the Washington, D.C. area that focuses on the issues of science and technology and how science and technology is changing our society. For uh, almost uh, 17 years now, we've been uh, the host and home for the International Center for Terrorism Studies, uh, headed up by Professor Yona Alexander. And I think you'll, uh, most people here will agree and understand that, uh, that the center that Yona heads is one of the most foremost uh, academic institutions and consortium of institutions in the world focusing on all aspects of terrorism. Professor Alexander's group has looked at, studied, and published uh, documents on every conceivable realm and aspect of terrorism for many, many years. He personally is an author of over a hundred books on the subject. And we're quite proud here at the Potomac Institute to be the home of his uh, academic efforts. We're also privileged to have partnered with the uh, International Law Institute, and Professor Don Wallace is here representing them, as, as he always has, as the chairman of the International Law Institute. And for well over a decade, we've partnered with uh, ILI and, and Professor Wallace uh, to put, bring to you these uh, seminars and these discussions on terrorism. Today, we're focusing and going to have a very, I hope, very spirited uh, discussion, uh, presentations followed by a question and answer discussion with the audience. Um, one of the most insidious and hard to defend parts of terrorism, that associated with the lone wolf, where we have built up a tremendous body of policy and procedure for dealing with terror groups and state-sponsored terrorism, the lone wolf, the individual who plots and puts together a plot, often in sympathy with the group, it's often hard to find beforehand. Finding and dealing with lone wolves will continue to be maybe one of the most challenging aspects of society going forward. How we use technology to help us do that and how we figure out how to use technology to do that while protecting our civil liberties will be one of the key questions of our time. So it is with great uh, privilege that I get to introduce the session today on uh, lone wolf terrorism. And uh, with that, uh, I'll once again try and introduce the person who's impossible to introduce, that's Professor Yona Alexander, who is, I think, the world's foremost expert on terrorism. Professor? Thank you very much, uh, Mike, for your always generous uh, introduction. Let's talk about technology. I would appreciate if you kindly turn off this, because we're being on tape. Um, <clears throat> now, Mike mentioned uh, the collaboration with uh, our academic uh, partners, the International Law uh, Institute, and in fact, the uh, latest publication with Professor Don Wallace and our colleagues is on Canada and terrorism, selected perpetrators. Uh, the next one is going to be available next week on the Hezbollah. And uh, the next one is uh, on Iran, which I guess many people are concerned about. Now, uh, today we do have a, a very distinguished panel to discuss what Mike indicated, one of the most insidious uh, challenges, and um, we're really delighted uh, to have a variety of um, perspectives. And let me introduce at this point members of the panel, um, Spike Bauman, former Deputy General Counsel, National Security of the FBI, currently Distinguished Fellow, the Center on National Security Law, University of Virginia uh, School of Law, and this is the other partner that we collaborate with, 
uh, then Professor Amit Kumar at the School of Foreign Service at George Georgetown University, and then Kyle Olson, who is the president of the Olson Group, and Professor Don Wallace. I'm going to say a few words later on uh, in terms of introduction before they uh, speak. Now, usually what we try to do is to keep always in mind that terrorism is only one of the many uh, challenges uh, in terms of man-made <coughs> and the natural disasters. And therefore, we always try to remember and never forget uh, those uh, who were victimized by both uh, Mother Nature and man-made disasters. And uh, at this opportunity, I would like to express sympathy for the victims in Latvia, those who were killed at the supermarket, and those who were killed the typhoon in the Philippines, and of course, those who were victimized by terrorist attacks from Algeria to Boston to Kenya, and the ongoing attacks now in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, or Pakistan, and elsewhere. So that's one aspect to express our solidarity and sympathy uh, with the victims. And then, of course, on the other side, we have to honor uh, those who serve, those who save lives, those who protect lives, all the way from the first responders to the police, the military, and those who serve governments, those who serve the civic society to combat uh, terrorism. Now, President Obama, he made a statement at uh, the NDU uh, several years ago, and he said that the most uh, likely scenario, and I quote him, that we would have to guard against the, what he calls the lone wolf operation rather than a large, well-coordinated terrorist attack, unquote. Obviously, he put the lone wolf on the agenda, but today, obviously, the top security concern is the Iran nuclear campaign and the Geneva deal, and we would have to, obviously, uh, focus attention on this issue as well. And the question arises whether there is a link or connection between the lone wolf and the weapons mass destruction, and we're going to discuss it also <coughs> today. Now, uh, again, academically, as Mike uh, indicated, we try to touch on many of the issues which relate also to the lone wolf. Now, Today, uh, it happened that this is the 50th uh, anniversary of the assassination <coughs> of JFK. And in fact, exactly 50 years ago, the state funeral uh, took uh, place. And I'm mentioning this because even the assassination of JFK is a big question mark in terms of the involvement of the Oswald, whether we're dealing with a lone wolf or maybe a member of some sort of uh, conspiracy. Uh, let me also uh, mention uh, that today, the month of uh, November, we have to uh, remember some uh, other attacks <coughs> which uh, relate to the lone uh, wolf, uh, whether the attack at uh, Fort Hood in Texas. But prior to that, in 1950, uh, we do remember the attempted assassination of President uh, Truman by Puerto Rican uh, terrorists. And the question is, what is the definition of the lone uh, wolf. Uh, again, there are many examples in uh, recent history uh, that 
focus attention on the lone wolf, for example, in 1985, 18 years ago, when Igal Amir, an individual, assassinated <coughs> um, the Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin, and uh, this can be regarded also as a lone wolf uh, operation. Now, um, again, the uh, history um, recorded many uh, instances of the lone wolf, but before we go into specifically the lone wolf examination, I would like to suggest a context to our discussion in terms of <coughs> trying to look at the forest and not only at the trees. By that I mean what are really the challenges that we are facing on the holistic uh, level of the security uh, agenda. In other words, the horizontal challenges, all the way from organized crime <coughs> and the linkage between organized crime, terrorism, the trafficking, whether we're discussing drug trafficking or human trafficking or guns trafficking and so on, the financial threats around the world, the maritime security concerns, the aviation security, transportation security concerns, the infrastructure security, cyber security, and environmental security. Uh, I just returned from a NATO meeting in Ankara, Turkey. We discussed specifically the threats to North Africa, to the Maghreb, <coughs> to the Sahel, and West Africa, and so on, the threat, the arch of instability, all the way from the Atlantic to the Red Sea and beyond. So what is the bottom line? I think the bottom line, Mike indicated clearly, the whole issue of the civil liberties, the technology. I would submit that we have three questions that we have to ponder again and again. Number one, after 9-11, is the worst yet to come. Secondly, will civilization survive? And now we're dealing with the Iranian challenge. And thirdly, to come back to Mike's, I think, concern, whether counterterrorism, our strategies, and democracy can coexist. Now, if we look <laughs> at the various definitions related to terrorism, we couldn't even agree universally how to define terrorism. And let alone, what does it mean, the lone wolf? I would submit that we are facing basically three types of challenges by the perpetrators. One, that we call them the lone wolf, but we can call them also the individuals who are involved, or the freelance are terrorists. Uh, secondly, I think we have to look at the groups, some more organized groups, some more sophisticated, less sophisticated, and obviously state sponsor of terrorism. So fundamentally, we do have individuals, some of them are mentally deranged, some of them uh, wave the flag, as crusaders or martyrs. We have single issue po politic extremism. We have ideologically based groups. We have ethnic, racial, and religious intolerance and movements. And we have nationalist and separatist actors. And then we mentioned the criminals and the political mercenaries. In the United States, again, uh, we see all this variety all the way from what we call the hate crime, uh, for example, the white supremacists, uh, for example, uh, those who are loyal to different kind of ideologies or to the religious-based ideologies. So in terms of what's happening in the United States itself, whether we call them a freelance or whether we call them leaderless resistance groups, we find two types. One are the non-political 
on terrorists, for example, we had the Navy Yard shooting again back in September or this month at the Los Angeles uh, airport. And then, of course, we have the lone wolves uh, in America going all the way back, if you will, to 1968 when Sihan Sihan, a, a Palestinian, decided to assassinate Bob Kennedy uh, because he was motivated by anti-Israel uh, sentiments uh, at the time. Uh, also, all of us uh, remember uh, the Unabomber uh, who conducted a campaign for many, many years. Uh, he was radica radicalized over the disillusionment with a uh, technological society uh, at the time. And then, of course, we all remember what happened in Oklahoma City in 1995, the attack on the federal building uh, when 168 people were killed and 800 people were wounded. And then, of course, the most uh, recent, the Fort Hood shooting uh, that um, Nidal Malik Hassan uh, perpetrated at the time. So again, I think when we talk about the lone wolf, uh, the individual uh, acting on his or her own, incidentally, we do have an increasing number of women who are also involved. Uh, we can look at the non-political motivation, and then we can look at the political motivation. So fundamentally, I think what we are going to discuss today are basically the two types that we have to consider, but mostly the political type. And we can spend a semester at least to discuss the various uh, trends. I'm not going to do it now, but I think it would be useful in terms of some context to discuss this uh, phenomenon which is not very well uh, understood, but we have to keep always in mind that terrorists are not born, they are created by various political, social, economic uh, environments. In other words, the lone wolf of terrorists, they don't appear from other space. They are part of our societies and they are subject to the political and social and economic ideologies and the religious environments. In other words, many of them share values uh, through technology, uh, through the website, and so forth. Uh, some operate on one basis on a single attack, and some operate on multiple serial attacks, and so on. There are a number of studies that uh, were developed uh, over the years. We're trying to follow it on a daily uh, basis, and I think it requires a great deal of interest in terms of radicalization and the international society tries to understand what are some of the root causes and what can be done to deal with that. So hopefully uh, today's discussion will provide, I think, the uh, initial context for our discussion. And the first speaker, as I mentioned, is Spike Bauman, who has a very rich background in the government, in the military, diplomatic activity in the academic community. In fact, he's teaching uh, one course now at CW, and one of our uh, interns right there, uh, <coughs> and he is a student in his class. So you prepare for the class tomorrow. So uh, <coughs> I think uh, Spike um, has a very broad <coughs> experience uh, in the government and national counter intelligence executive, and uh, also uh, in various other senior positions in the FBI. And uh, as I indicated, he has also a very rich academic uh, background. 
So we're looking forward to uh, his remarks. And then we're going to follow up by uh, our other panelists and hopefully then develop a discussion with the audience. Spike, would you mind to come up here? Well, thank you, Yona. I, uh, I first became, be, started thinking about lone wolf ter terrorism right after 9-11. At the time, I was the Deputy General Counsel for National Security Affairs at the FBI. And <clears throat> we, uh, at, we really didn't know an awful lot about Al-Qaeda at that point in time. But we began to look into it very quickly. And among, among the things that we learned were that, was that there were a number of training camps being run by al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. And the more we looked at it, the more we realized that uh, uh, while al-Qaeda was trained in the, in the camps uh, in Afghanistan, an awful lot of other people had gone there through there too, not necessarily affiliated with al-Qaeda, not necessarily intending to go out and immediately do something on a terrorist plane. Uh, but perhaps going there for training to do something later on. And so we began to think about what would happen if one of those people began to you know, decide to do something unattached, unaffiliated. And the reason that made a big difference is because the way we looked for terrorists uh, and spies and so forth in the United States was largely through the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which is a... a, a operated by a secret court. It has secret warrants for wiretaps and physical searches. But the predicate for a FISA uh, warrant is that the target is either a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power. And if you have a person who's acting on his own, it's pretty hard to tuck that person into an agency of a foreign power. So one of the things that I did fairly, uh, fairly soon after 9-11 is I suggested that perhaps we could have an amendment to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act to look at this single person, which caused a lot of consternation because it did change the way we had thought about the, the act from the start. We eventually did get an amendment to the, the uh, act for that purpose. Uh, but we also began to realize some other things that hap would, might happen too. One of the things that started me thinking along a slightly different line was soon after 9-11, uh, Dutch foreign intelligence uh, produced three uh, studies about uh, radicals in their uh, part of the world. And one of the really startling things that came out of that was that they, they did not find a lot of ideologues. They found a lot of people who, want, who seemed to be, uh, have an affinity for violence just wanted to do something violently. And as a consequence, they started looking at those individuals and actually did disrupt, uh, not only in the Netherlands, but in other countries as well, some things that were beginning to happen or were being planned to happen, uh, simply because they were focused on these individuals. Well, we began to look at that, and then another thing happened. In 2005, we had the, uh, the British underground bombings. And we began to look at that point and think, well, you know, we've got people in the country that may be discontents too. Something we've not really focused on all that much past the Timothy McVeigh's. And so now we're starting to think, well, we might have people who are not affiliated with Al-Qaeda or something similar. We might have people in our own communities who want to do violence. And so we began to think more and more that there, there might be some other uh, thing to do about this. When I testified in 2002 uh, Congress to ask for the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act to be amended, uh, the, I have to say the Congress was very skeptical. They were not re really ready to accept the fact that we might have these other types of individuals in the United States. And it really took some period of time for the Congress to come around. 
they, they eventually did. But the one thing, the other thing that has happened through the years is that we have fairly well decimated the ability of Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda Al type affiliates to carry out the large complex type of operation that 9-11 represented. Could it happen again? Yeah. But what's more likely? And here I'm going to give you a prediction. In the United States, and probably in most of the Western countries as well, future terrorist acts are more likely to be less well organized than we saw with 9-11. They're likely to be less complex. They're less likely to succeed. They are less likely to be as lethal if they do succeed. They're going to be more numerous. And in all likelihood, I believe that they will be mostly conducted by citizens or long-term residents of the United States. Now, why do I say that? First of all, I think that's what the, the sequence of events that I have just laid out sort of points us towards. But secondly, if we stop and take a look at what has happened in the United States since 9-11, we've had over 50 uh, terrorist, according to FBI reporting, over 50 terrorist attempts defeated. And we've also had a number of terrorist associated persons arrested. And of those who are associated with or had some link to Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda type of, of philosophy, more than half of them were United States citizens. 35% of them were born in the United States. 60% of them had a college degree. And 60% of them were either working or in school. These were not the people that we were looking at right after 9-11. These were not the discontented Arabs who were going to the uh, camps in Afghanistan to try and learn how to make an explosive to try and learn, you know, tactics, uh, or maybe to go learn to shoot a gun, who knows? But you know, that's basically that we're looking at, a, a, I think today, an entirely different cadre of people than we thought about, you know, many, many years ago. And what bothers me about it is I don't think we're, th we're looking at it hard enough. I don't think that we are focused as much on the, the lone wolf, the single individual, who might have no affiliation with anybody, who might not even be an, an ideologue, who might just want to go blow something up because he's a discontent. Again, you can think back to the, the example of Timothy McVeigh, but we've seen others in the United States who are like this as well. And I think that's what the future holds for us. I, I will leave it there. Obviously, I, I think uh, <clears throat> the way you, you described it, uh, there is no doubt uh, about your um, analysis on the basis of what already uh, happened. And um, not only U.S. citizens or permanent residents, but also those who come here to study on a visa or illegals uh, as well. But uh, it is also characterized in the European uh, countries as well as uh, we have seen with the terrible tragedy in Norway um, in the name of some secular uh, ideology. So I think this is um, the wave of the future. Now we're going to uh, have another uh, perspective um, to discuss the uh, issue with Dr. Kumar, whom I introduced uh, earlier. Um, and uh, he is uh, teaching also Georgetown, the School of Foreign uh, Service, and um, he specializes on the financial aspects as well as on South Asia, the case study uh, in that particular region. So I ask him to bring in some of his uh, findings and perspectives and then we're going to have a third speaker 
to focus more on the weapons mass destruction. Dr. Kumar, could you kind of come up here? Uh, many thanks to uh, Yona and Mike for having me here, and it's an honor being here uh, for the second time and with such a distinguished panel. And I thank uh, my previous speaker, uh, Spike, for an excellent presentation. Um, essentially, I'm going to run through some important aspects of, of lone wolf terrorism, in, incorporating some South Asian examples as well as others. Um, basically, when we talk about what is lone wolf terrorism, well, most people conflate it with the fact that it's one person who plans it, executes it, and just finances it. Uh, the reality is, especially in the context of what Yona calls political terrorism, the radicalization process. Um, a single individual may perpetrate the act at the end stage, but in terms of radicalization, he may uh, more likely than not be radicalized through either a group or the internet or through some army experience or what have you. So that's a distinction one has to be very clear about. And uh, the knee-jerk response is just because it's a single individual, he must be kind of a lone wolf terrorist. He may not be a terrorist at all, but he may be a terrorist as well. And he may be a member, either covert or overt, of a terrorist organization. Some previous interface with the terrorist organization, the radicalization process through the terrorist organization, some previous travel in terrorist camps, um, like, for example, if you look at the Boston bomber, one of them had traveled to Central Asia. So it's hard to really call the person who traveled a lone wolf terrorist, really, because he was indoctrinated in Dagestan, um, along with the internet, of course. Uh, secondly, it's been alluded to by Yona and, and, and uh, Spike as well. What are the, the types of lone wolf terrorists? They could be secular, they could uh, Allah, Timothy, McQuay, they could be religious, the Al Qaeda guys could be single issue, let like Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, could be criminal as well, and could be idiosyncratic. When you, when you say criminal, uh, there could be, for example, the anthrax attacker in 2001, Bruce Ivins, who passed away in 2009, he had a criminal intent. So it's, and it's hard to make watertight compartments, it has to be one or the other, it could be a mishmash of all the five categories or one or more of them. What factors contribute to lone wolf terrorism? could be social and political grievances, uh, could be documented psych psychological disorders as we've discovered in the course of many, including the Boston Bomber and others. The affinity, it could be affinity with or membership of terrorist organizations or criminal gangs. Uh, then there could be a broadcasting of terrorist intentions. For example, in Norway, Anders Breivik uh, had broadcast what he was going to do. So there are warning signals, some telltale signals that the lone would be lone wolf attacker will be doing something spectacular. Then there is the uh, role of enablers in radicalization, for example, prisons, uh, uh, the internet, or or previous military experience. Then there are catalytic agents in the radicalization process. Uh, could be personal and political triggering events. Uh, for example, Timothy McWay went through a radicalization after his experience. Uh, in the first Gulf War and after that. He developed such a loathing for the federal government and he wasn't for state rights. So, uh, you know, you have, you have all these uh, basket case uh, folks who may be radicalized in one of many ways. Um, then they are, they are uh, what we call scocastic uh, terrorism, which are uh, uh, basically folks like Zawahiri and Bin Laden and Anwar Ab Ablaki uploading videos and exhorting uh, their their Al Qaeda brethren to to engage in lone wolf attacks. So that could be what we call a really scocastic process, where the 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 perpetrators of the act would be what what some terrorists call missiles. Actually, what do terrorist organizations achieve using lone wolf terror? I'm I'm going to focus a little more from from here on now on on terrorist organizations and how they they may use or utilize lone wolf attackers. What do terrorist organizations achieve using lone wolf terrorism? They're low cost, they're greater impact, require low planning, they're difficult to predict and detect, and take counterterrorism measures against. There is this aspect of plausible deniability. For example, if you look at the Mumbai bombings, initially when the Mumbai bombings in 2008 take place, and this is topical because we're celebrating the fifth anniversary of the heinous attacks in Mumbai. Uh, 
exactly on November 26, 2008, when the 60-hour carnage began, really. Uh, initially, the news report said it's, it's, a, it's an outfit called the Deccan Mujahideen. Then there was the Indian Mujahideen. And then we discovered Lashkar-e Taiba was trying to engage in what we call plausible deniability. It's not Lashkar-e Taiba, it's an offshoot of it. And then there could be threats of the Indian Mujahideen or a local criminal gang uh, in India. This has happened before because a Lashkar operator, if you look at uh, David Coleman Headley's surveillance of the Mumbai targets in 2007, so is he a lone wolf terrorist or is he kind of, um, uh, kind of set there by, by Lashkar Taiba to act as a lone wolf terrorist and make people believe that this is an individual who's perpetrating acts on his own. There's the case of Hiran Bharat, uh, who was involved in the plot uh, to survey um, the, the, the financial institutions in New York and New Jersey and in Washington. So, uh, and then uh, there is this need to obviate uh, the, need, uh, the, the requirement on the part of the lone wolf terrorists to communicate with other members of the group. And this way, the, the, the terrorist organizations can engage in plausible deniability. It's the individual. I, I told you it's the individual, we aren't involved. And uh, last but not the least, what these lone wolf attacks, as, as far as terrorist organizations go, is they, 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 they show off would-be terrorists or would-be lone wolves, that here's one guy who's committed this act, all of you can go and do the same thing. You know? That's what Avlaki has been saying, that's what Zawahiri said uh, this September, uh, exhorting would-be al-Qaeda sympathizers and radicals to lone wolf terror. Importantly enough, uh, what kind of CT strategies or counterterrorism strategies can be used against lone wolf terrorism? There could be community policing, where civilians may be involved. Um, easier said than done, but I think f uh, this, this, this Washington Metro buzz, uh, you know, uh, say something if you see something. That's a very typical example of what could be done, because a lone wolf terrorist, at least I would consider a lone wolf terrorist as someone who, who executes um, uh, and, and finances and plans the attack, but is radicalized by an external agent i.e. the terrorist organization. Whatever means, whatever enablers there might be, the internet, the military, uh, previous travel, previous contact, part of a sleeper cell, or what have you. Uh, then there is the need for federal, state, and local uh, kind of coordination and information sharing in this, trying to nip all these would-be attacks in the bud. Um, then there is monitoring internet usage, and that brings in a very important civil liberties uh, issue. And, and what, with what powers can the government monitor uh, the internet? It obviously can and it should, because whatever is taking place, the stew is brewing over the internet. Uh, what kind of messaging, what kind of chatting, how does a would-be uh, lone wolf terrorist finance um, his, his, his terrorist plots? How does he implement? What kind of interactions does he have? Then there is this question of, of rapid response. For example, if the Norwegian authorities had responded after the first attack to Anders Breivik, uh, and, you know, it's, again, it's difficult to predict what, what that Basset case is going to do. Uh, but if they'd only responded to that, uh, he, he may not have predicted. Yeah, he may not have perpetrated the second attack, which was a more heinous one, with larger casualties, actually. Then there is this question of, of investigating uh, not just lone wolf terrorist attacks, but the botched plots as well. There's so much more one can learn from a failed plot. Faisal Shahzad, for example, or the underwear bomber. Um, there's so much more one can learn in terms of a plot that's been foiled or botched. Uh, what kind of implications does uh, lone wolf terrorism have for counterterrorism measures? It's difficult to detect and, th and therefore unorthodox strategies are called for, including some of the ones that I mentioned, community policing. Uh, the, the CD strategies need to be designed and to prepare for, respond, and prevent such terrorist attacks. Um, and it's difficult to make out when we're doing this whether the attack is on, uh, it, it's by a criminal or by a secular terrorist or a religious terrorist or, or idiosyncratic terrorist. So it's difficult to really tailor make the strategy to, to kind of address the, the, the potential plot or the potential perpetration of terrorist action. Um, there are obviously issues uh, of whether lone wolf terrorist attacks are, are more possible in developed societies versus developing societies. Uh, 
in the context of South Asian nations particularly, their information sharing methods, their, their monitoring measures are not as good as ours or our other allies in the developed world. So there is a thinking amongst uh, intelligence and law enforcement circles that it's, it, it's harder to perpetrate or plan a lone wolf terrorist plot in a place like India or any other country in South Asia than it, there is in the developed world. So there is, an opportunity, uh, there is an opportunity to study what's going on in terms of the lack of lone wolf terrorist attacks, thank God, in, in South Asian countries or in other developing societies. Vizu is the real possibility, as we've seen time in and time out, of, of terrorist attacks here. Uh, lastly, I just want to be, uh, when I talk about radicalization, I want um, uh, all of us to look at carefully what does radicalization entail? And what is Al-Qaeda? When, when we say you know, bin Laden is gone, Al-Qaeda central is damaged, we are uh, kind of a little bit obsessed with the organization of Al-Qaeda, the organizational structure of Al-Qaeda. There is the Al-Qaeda ideology, of course, which, is, which we haven't been able to do much about, though obviously de-radicalization in prisons or counter-radicalization narratives, for example, are important strategies to employ. Um, then there is the Al-Qaeda movement, which is still intact. I mean, if you look at... If you look at the, 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 the ideology or the movement of, of Al-Qaeda to, to grab local separatist tendencies in the Kashmir region or, or the Tuareg rebellion in Mali uh, or in other parts of the world um, or the, the, the separatist cost in, 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 in South Asia, i.e. the Taliban. Yeah. Uh, that coupled with the fact that there is increased interaction amongst affiliates of Al-Qaeda points to the and of course, would uh, would be or real or or potential lone wolf terrorists are part of this movement. There is some connection, either ideological or in person or both. So so it's difficult again to really um, sp uh, spring to a judgment that okay, if you have a single individual, then it's only an individual act. I, I would reckon that 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 radicalization, in some strange sense, is a kind of material support as well. Uh, most people wouldn't recognize it, but we've got to go beyond the obvious. What appears uh, on the surface may not be true or entirely true. So it's, it's good to dig deep and look at more important, crucial aspects of radicalization, and a lot more can be done in terms of engagement with the imprisoned individual, for example, or to prevent a, someone who's been imprisoned for a criminal activity not to become a terrorist, to address uh, either through religious or through education means or, or, or kind of work on their employment, you know, future employment outside prison. Uh, because a lot of literature deals with recidivists and folks who've been left out of Guantanamo Bay and are perpetrating attacks in AQAP or in other outfits, um, either in Syria uh, or Yemen or elsewhere. Uh, well, that's it for now. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is Kyle uh, Olson, who has very rich uh, experience as well, um, consulting, advising uh, government and uh, industry and the academic uh, community, uh, particularly uh, related to the nature of the threat. And I remember very vividly uh, after the attack in Tokyo, uh, the serene and um, which was mass destruction that um, you were kept uh, quite uh, busy to make sense out, out of that. And I, I really think that uh, with your uh, very wide uh, experience is to uh, share with us your thinking uh, about the various uh, scenarios and possibilities of uh, the use uh, of uh, what we call um, some some sort of weapon of mass destruction, whether the chemical, the serene, um, or the anthrax, and uh, some uh, some cases that uh, we have seen uh, in the United States uh, and abroad uh, related to that potential. So, um, Kyle, um, if you please come up here. The lone wolf terrorist, 
is um, is obviously a subject of, of great interest, great concern. Um, uh, you threw several questions out uh, right at the beginning, Yona. You asked uh, whether or not uh, whether or not the the, uh, the future for for terrorism in general, but certainly the lone wolf terrorist is. Do we are we looking at something worse than than nine eleven, a uh, an event on that scale? You asked the question about whether society can survive, and you asked also whether or not uh, democracy and our freedoms can survive in that environment. Um, first of all, just echoing a couple of themes which uh, which were already voiced up here. The lone wolf represents a, a unique problem. Uh, I think we sometimes throw the label terrorism around or terrorist around uh, uh, in rather too expansive a fashion. Sometimes it's a it's simply a person who's out for revenge. In other persons, in other cases, it might be a criminal activity. Uh, throwing the uh, the terrorism word seems to put it in a comfortable basket for many of us, and I think that that's a uh, that 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 can uh, can lead us down a, a sometimes uh, sort of slippery slope from an, anal an analytical point of view. I would also note that when I when I think about the lone wolf, I, I think back. You know, I think we often see Timothy McVeigh as an example of a lone wolf terrorist, but in fact, of course, he had some help. And so, lone wolf may may be may be fair to say that lone wolf or semi lone wolf uh, terrorism is a is a is a similar threat. Something significantly below the, the level of an Al-Qaeda or an Al-Qaeda um, uh, an affiliate, uh, and yet at the same time represents something that is outside that, that construct. And the reason I get there is because the lone wolf or someone with a, maybe, maybe a very, very small group certainly has the potential for accessing weapons that uh, we, would lump, we would lump into the weapon of mass destruction category. Uh, the, the classic hierarchy, the chemical, biological, uh, radiological hierarchy, is one that we can look at and we can say, okay, many of these are within the reach of an individual. Uh, you can certainly look at the notion of being able to access some quantity of toxic chemicals and find some way to introduce those into a setting. Now, that doesn't need to, it doesn't need to be a mass kill-off. It doesn't need to be the kind of incident that produces body counts in the hundreds. But, for example, the introduction of a toxic chemical into a, uh, into a school building, um, the uh, access to cylinders of chlorine, for example, or some other material, certainly has the potential to create a toxic event. 9-11 scale, probably not. But on the other hand, the threat is there. And there are certainly materials that are available out there that are accessible, whether we're talking about getting discrete quantities, whether we're talking about uh, uh, capturing, disrupting, diverting, Trucks, truckloads, materials like that, or even an attack on a on a on a production or storage facility, the collateral effects are significant, are real, and could be could be very meaningful in that regard. And certainly within the capacity, the capability of someone with a at least even a, just a rudimentary understanding of the fact that if there's a label on the side that says this is bad for you, it's probably going to be bad for somebody else as well. On the other hand, a chemical weapons attack like the one we saw in the Tokyo subway attack back in the mid-90s, that was an event that required a very robust investment on the part of a, of a, of a group of individuals. Um, sir, you know, we're talking about investments on the score of, of tens of, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, and a commitment to work on that, on that problem over a period of time. That is maybe something that distinguishes uh, that kind of a threat uh, maybe that pushes it out of the classic lone wolf pattern. And I don't, uh, I don't ignore the fact that the Unabomber maintained a campaign over a number of years, but his work was basically the small, the small package bombs which he had developed a knack for processing and producing. Um, chemical weapon, probably, probably in, in a meaningful way, a little bit outside the scope of the individual. Might not be outside the, group, the scope of a, of a, smaller, of a small group. Biological weapons, we often hear about the poor man's nuclear weapon, the poor man's atom bomb. Biological threat is a legitimate threat in the sense that the biological weapon can be self-replicating in the environment. You don't need a large industrial base to produce one if you have access to the appropriate stocks up front. The infectious disease is an infectious disease. And as anyone who survived flu season will tell you, the little kid next door is a delivery device for a biological weapon of some sort. The biological threat is also one that can be an example of a talented dabbler. 
working in, in his private in his own laboratory, working or diverting research facilities in a uh, in a university or a hospital setting. The technology is certainly there. I mean, again, biological weapons. Uh, I think the reference was made to the uh, to the uh, um, the anthrax attacks uh, earlier in this decade. Anthrax technology is essentially 1950s level weapons grade technology. You look back at some of the other biological agents, biological agents have been used as a weapon either with great conscious thought in advance or, or, uh, or as a, a collateral effect going back for hundreds of years. An individual could certainly find a way to apply a biological weapon in a selected attack. Again, are we talking about a society killer or are we talking about a city killer? Probably not. But on the other hand, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the lone wolf has, and this is true for all weapons of mass destruction scenarios or all mass killing scenarios, the lone wolf terrorist operates in essentially a vacuum in terms of supervision, in terms of restrictions or limitations, in terms of any kind of filter on what is or isn't acceptable. The true lone wolf terrorist is only answerable to himself or herself. And therefore, by the way, that means that many of the traditional deterrent tactics that we use as governments, as militaries, as law enforcement organizations, short of actually identifying and capturing the, the would-be attacker, are essentially not going to have very much impact. The lone wolf operates without committees, he operates without worrying about going before the before a uh, before an appropriations board of any kind, he does what he can do when he wants to do it, and he does it to his timetable. The one that um, obviously high explosives fall well within that universe that, that goes without saying. The one that is probably I think of of uh, most significant concern in terms of its uh, real footprint is of course the radiological threat, and for the last. 10, 15 years, I think one of the, uh, one of the re recurring questions in the par on the part of security planners everywhere is why haven't we been hit with a dirty bomb? Dirty bombs are the easiest, easiest weapon probably in that whole, in that whole panoply of, of choices to make. Probably the easiest weapon to assemble, the easiest weapon to use. Obtain a specific quantity of radiological material. It doesn't have to be very high grade. Wrap it around a little bit of conventional explosive, which we know you can access, and detonate it. The effects do not even have to be lethal. The sociological, economic, political, cultural impacts of detonating a radiological device, in a, a dispersal device in a, in, a, in, a, in a major urban area, in, a, in, the, in the, the monumental core of the city of Washington, would be substantial. Because the all clear notice is one of the almost impossible things to obtain from any government agency. Oh yeah, that dirty bomb went off down the street, but don't worry, we've determined that you're safe. Go ahead. Also, let's not, let's not leave out the notion of the cyber attack. Uh, we, could argue, we could argue that the, uh, that the, uh, the, recent, uh, the recent actions by Anonymous, as well as the release of the NSA files, uh, constitutes an act of terrorism. Certainly the impacts have been dramatic, they've been uh, political in nature, but they have also certainly had impacts uh, far beyond what you would expect to find on a thumb drive. And that is certainly, once again, an example of, of an intelligent individual, an arrogant individual, and a disassociative individual feeling free to carry out what he or she felt to be a legitimate exercise of his self-imposed authority. So you want to going back to the questions you asked. 9-11, uh, a redo on that. For the lone wolf, I would argue that a 9-11 spectacular or an event with that kind of a body count is probably beyond, beyond their reach. Probably. There are so you could you could have the perfect storm. You can argue that 9-11 itself was the perfect storm. It certainly exceeded the expectations of, of, uh, of Al-Qaeda. Will society survive? Yes, society will survive. Society will survive because we are more resilient than any one individual or one small group of individuals. We are a society of 350 million within a larger society of 6 billion. Yes, society will survive. But at the end of the day, you ask the question about democracy and our values and our rights and our privileges. As noted before, the lone wolf operates 
without the restrictions, the filters, the constraints that we associate with organizations. Even terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda have a command structure and a decision matrix. The lone wolf gets up this morning and he feels like killing you, he will kill you. I look forward to our discussion. Obviously, I think you raised some very uh, profound uh, issues and questions, and I hope we can develop a discussion among the, the panelists as well as uh, the, uh, the audience. Um, that's why I think we have to, um, in our analysis, make a distinction, a very clear distinction between the individual, what we call the individual terror, and the group, organized uh, group, as well as state-sponsored terrorism. And uh, by the way, uh, as a criticism of uh, the deal, whether it is a historic deal or not, but um, concerns of uh, some members of Congress and others, that uh, in the package there was no uh, indication related to state-sponsored terrorism of, uh, of Iran, uh, their involvement in Syria, and so forth. So I, I think um, the bottom line is the nature, the intensity of the threat on the part of states, uh, groups like Al-Qaeda and the individual. Uh, what is uh, absolutely correct, I think, Kyle, that you uh, mentioned in terms of the impact is um, the number of attacks according to our studies, maybe 2% of all the attacks of terrorism, and we're talking about thousands, are related to the individuals. But one attack can have a very significant impact. I, I mentioned before the assassination of uh, President, I mean the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, Rabin, Incidentally, he was spoke at our seminars and so forth by individual, undermined the peace process for many years. So again, it's not only the number, but the impact. And I think one, one of the uh, areas that we still have to consider, not only the political, the non-political, how many attacks we had in the United States at the schools with the availability of guns. And uh, in fact, one of the most uh, recent, um, I think, uh, letter with the, what, was it the anthrax or some other, other device that was sent to President Obama and to uh, Mayor, and New York City Mayor Bloomberg, uh, was really related to that particular issue. So again, I think uh, we have to look at the broader uh, picture and the whole issue of radicalization. And uh, it's through what uh, you said about the individual who does not um, look at uh, some approval by his peers or colleagues uh, as no constraints whatsoever. But that individual does not exist in a vacuum in terms of radicalization. And already, I think Dr. Kumar also mentioned uh, the uh, technology, the social media, for example, the internet, uh, and, and so forth, the inspiration that they had. So what I uh, propose that we can discuss again is uh, the whole uh, issue, how is the uh, lone wolf being created? Uh, again, I indicated that in general, the, the terrorists are, are not uh, born, but they are, are created. And again, we can condemn them, uh, as Dostoevsky observed a long time ago. Uh, we can be against the evil doers, but we cannot understand the mind of the evil doer. And this is the big puzzle. We cannot understand the mind of the lone uh, wolf. So again, uh, do you want to respond to some of the comments? each other, Dr. Kumar. Okay. Um, 
I I sort of agree with 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 uh, with, with Yona about the radicalization piece and. Much as de-radicalization and counter-radicalization programs could take care of the behavior, they in no way can have impact on the ideology. So the symptoms could be taken care of in terms of behavior in somewhat uh, uh, subtle measure, but in terms of the, the, uh, the ideology, which is so profound, uh, whatever the agents may be, could be triggering events, could be uh, you know, folks like uh, Al Zawahiri uh, or Al Ablaki or or Bin Laden or or Adam Gadan exhorting um, uh, these these uh, loose affiliate members or cell members or even potential lone wolf attackers. Uh, there's not much that can be done uh, as far as the ideology is concerned uh, because we don't really understand why they have this ideology of of uh, anti despot. That's one feature. The other is the the. Uh, the hatred towards U.S., Israel, and its allies. Uh, and thirdly, the, the, the movement, as I described earlier, towards a global Islamic caliphate. This is what they stand for. This is why they're foot soldiers. And they're foot soldiers uh, with a cause. You know, They may not have the kind of terrorist leaders as part of an organizational network or the financiers, per se, but they can be self-financed. But the ideology is something that they import from the outside. And to the extent that this interacts with their mental dilapidation or their mental disequilibrium, as I call it, or other personal or political grievances, um, uh, it's really difficult to fathom uh, what to do about it. And also, uh, this was mentioned earlier as well, uh, these guys could be criminals who are radicalized. These guys could be just criminals. They could be folks who are idiosyncratic. They just have very funny behavior patterns. Um, so it's difficult to really come out with measures per se. And uh, I, would, I would look at the ideology really as, and the whole radicalization process, as Yona mentioned, as the more important object to study. And you're very right in saying that uh, it's important how, how these lone wolves are created, how they're incubated, how they're made, uh, much rather than how they perpetrate the act, which is really the end stage, uh, or how they plan the act. So external influences on a would-be lone wolf jihadi or a terrorist is something that needs to be studied. And lone wolf terrorism is, uh, is hard to really uh, uh, theorize, and it's hard to really study in the absence of a plethora of case studies, really. So you can't have typologies for lone wolf terrorism. Every attack is, is unique and special with a different message and a different uh, ideological impact uh, and so on. So lone wolf terrorism cannot be a typology, it's only a tactic that, that could be used by, uh, uh, by would-be terrorists as well as non-terrorists, per se. Thanks. Uh, Spike, can I ask you a question from the law enforcement point of view? Um, one concern is uh, the role of intelligence and then um, sharing of intelligence in terms of the different agencies. How, how do you see this, uh, especially in light of the uh, recent revelation of the NSA, um, I think, saga, uh, in terms of the uh, question of the, um, the civil liberties uh, concerns that you worked on for so many years? Yeah, <coughs> civil liberties. Excuse me. <clears throat> Civil liberties was always one of the biggest concerns we had at the FBI because the FBI is unlike NSA, unlike the Central Intelligence Agency, 95% of what the NSA collects against are U.S. persons, you know, not foreigners. So we're, you know, we've always been very concerned about that. Um, I. I probably received at least one phone call a day from agents in the field who ask, can I do this, should I do this, you know, what's, where is the line? And so this is, is something, this is, you know, I, I, I mention that only to emphasize the fact that this was a real issue. Now if you come up to today and, and look at what the NSA is doing, uh, several different things. First of all, what the NSA is doing is collecting metadata. What the newspapers have not told you is the metadata is constitutionally unprotected. 
It is third-party information. It does not belong to you. It belongs to the telephone companies, and the telephone companies can do anything they want with it except give it to a federal officer without compel being compelled to do so. That's, that's one thing. I will say that when I argued for the creation of that statute, it's the Article 215 of the Patriot Act, when I argued for that one, I never anticipated, and I don't think anybody ever anticipated it would be used as it is being used today. Uh, because we looked at it as being something that would target a single person uh, for something. And uh, so that is that is another thing that's happening. But if you take the program and work it backwards a bit to 9-11, if we had had the opportunity at 9-11 to collate telephone messages, public addresses, and frequent flyer numbers, none of which is is constitutionally protected, we would have had th the possibility of discovering all 19 hijackers in the United States. Now, I'm not telling you we would have prevented 9-11 from happening because if we had uh, discovered all of them here and we had been following them and watching them and saw them get on the airplanes, 99% uh, I'm 99% I'm certain that what would have happened is the FBI agents who were following them would have uh, noted the plane that they got on, where they were going, and called the San Diego field office and told them to pick them up when they get when they arrived there. But my point is that that you can get this information from constit or, or valuable information that is constitutionally unprotected. The thing that you have to ask yourself, and this is what the government, I mean, what the public needs to ask itself. Two phases, two, uh, the flip side uh, of the question here. One question is, do you want the government to do everything it can to protect you? The other question is, do you want the government to look and, and record every time you visit a website or make a phone call? And those are real questions. Uh, right now, I will tell you that as a matter of law, what the, the NSA is doing for privacy purposes is not a privacy intrusion. <coughs> I will leave it to the judges of the FISA court to determine whether the, act, the activity is lawful, and 11 very senior judges have said it is, so I will, I will rest on that. But as a, pri a matter of privacy law, <coughs> nobody's privacy is being affected by this program. Thank you very much uh, <coughs> for this uh, clarification. Mm -hmm. I suggest that we develop some sort of discussion um, in terms of number one, perhaps the radicalization uh, process of uh, some of these individuals all the way from alienation, uh, for example, or unemployment or whatever it is. Uh, secondly, what are some of the strategies that are available uh, to deal with this on the local level, on the national level, and the international level? We do have in uh, the audience uh, those who have uh, very broad experience in government and outside government, and I would like to invite them to uh, participate. Uh, first, uh, Mike Kraft, who worked for many years at the State Department, the Counterterrorism uh, Office. Would you share some of your views on the lone wolf uh, idea? You can come up here if you'd like. Yeah. Maybe I can project. Uh, First of all, uh, I want to pick up something that Spike said about uh, people who have a tendency for violent acts. You know, there's a psychological aspect to this, of course. And we saw this, for example, with the IRA when they reached agreement. Some people could not put down the, the tools and be, uh, develop the real IRA. Um, it seems to me one of the tools that we haven't talked about yet is the FBI has conducted sting operations against lone wolves and be interested in your thoughts or anybody else working for FBI and DOJ. What are the guidelines? When, when do you start on this? And the other thing that occurs to me that it's a psychological aspect taking up the, the violence things. There may be some similarities between people who conduct violence for various reasons like uh, the uh, shootings and, and uh, the mass shootings that we've had, various incidents, the Navy Yard, etc and people who do it for terrorist motives. 
part of the problem is detecting somebody when they, before they go off the deep end. I mean, I'm struck how many times when they identify the culprit, the neighbors and others say, well, we didn't know or he seemed to be a nice guy and you know nothing out of line. And it turns out sometimes there were some indicators along the lines. My, my daughter lived in the same neighborhood of the Boston Bombers and helped cover it some of the New York Times. And it was only later that people said, oh yeah, you know, he sounded, this guy sounded strange or radical. Where's that dividing line with privacy, you know, where people report it? I think it's still a fuzzy area we, still, we haven't really uh, been able to address. But anyway, getting back to the tools, it seems to me one of them is the possible the NSA intercepts, um, the patterns that you talked about, and the other is the sting operations. The third is the de de-radicalization. I slightly disagree with you that on the, you can't get rid of the ideology, perhaps, but if you can somehow discourage people from acting on that ideology, we're still ahead of the game. But it's a very hard thing to measure. You know, it's hard to measure what you succeed or don't succeed in. Okay. Uh, by the way, Mike, uh, could you comment on the role of the media? Because at one time in your life, you you cover these uh, events for the media. Does the media have a role in terms of the radicalization of process? Um, I, I think there's two aspects, and, and though I. My, my uh, involvement in journalism was before the terrorism episodes really developed. Uh, it was covering Washington and overseas. But, yeah, uh, there's a certain amount of attempts of the, the glamorization of terrorists sometimes as romantic freedom fighters. In fact, I was recruited partly to the State Department in 1985 when uh, Secretary Schultz wanted to start a public diplomacy campaign against terrorism. One of the things we found was that especially in Europe and the Middle East, people tend to glamorize terrorists. And the media sometimes plays a, a, a role in this, sometimes inadvertently, sometimes by <coughs> carrying some of the, reporting some of the claims without the, the, the counterbalancing. And then when there's an incident, it's always very difficult because um, reports come out, sometimes reporters are re um, reporting what they hear from police officials or local officials who only have part of the story. And that's why there's often so much confusion around. And then there's another aspect um, w which we had to deal with the State Department. For example, there, was a, there were attacks in London, I think on, uh, I believe the I Libyan or Iranian embassy and the press was sort of, TV was showing where the, <coughs> where Scotland Yard people were stationed, etc. And there's been issues in trying to restrain the press from quoting information or reporting things that might be useful to the terrorists. I think this happened in Mumbai too, that somehow they're picking up radio re or TV reports and knew where the security forces were. So there's an issue of restraining the press. It's much more difficult in this country, I think, than say the UK, uh, because you have so many local TV reporters who are out there and sometimes, frankly, are rather green and, and are not kind of, don't have good relationships with the police and local authorities and just the last pitch is, is that I think it's important for local authorities, FBI, etc., to, to, try, to try to develop good relationships in, a, in advance with the key local media. So there's an element of trust when they ask them to hold off on something. Okay. Um, are there any uh, questions from the audience at this point? Yes, please. Please uh, Identify yourself for the, for the record. Um, my name Here is, is Mike. Stern. I'm retired and I spent some years in the... Oh, excuse me. My name is Carlos Stern. I, I'm retired. I spent some years in the Pentagon. But I, this is not a field that I work in professionally, but I'm interested in and I'm grateful that we can sit in on it. Uh, with regard to the your example on the 9-11, the hijackers, the real clue that was missed was a bunch of foreigners wanting to go to a flight school in Florida and were expressed openly that they had no need to learn to take off or land. And that was reported to the FBI because it certainly was a very bright signal. And uh, as they say, the, uh, the, the metaphor that Congress seems to use is connecting the dots. 
The same was with these Chechen boys. The, the, the Russians told uh, the United States that these guys were pr probably trouble, and that was not followed up. And there are many other examples. And the reason I'm bringing these up is the old adage that one learns more from mistakes than from successes. And I was hoping to hear a discussion of failures and how we have mined the information from the failure to do better next time. Thank well, you. <coughs> to, to, uh, with, as, with respect to your examples, you, you've conflated two different things with the flight schools. One of them was a bunch of people, foreigners, who were taking fl uh, flight lessons around the country. Not that they were not trying to learn to take off or land. They were just taking, they were learning how to fly. What was misquoted in the papers was the uh, instance of Musawi, the company that he was taking lessons from. They said that he didn't want to learn how to take off or land, when in fact that is precisely what he wanted to do. So that was mis mis uh, misrepresented in, in by the company and reported that way in the newspapers. I can't answer the, the issue about the, uh, the Boston bombers because I wasn't with the FBI at the time, but I will give you one little vignette. Uh, when the Terrace Screening Center was opened up, and this is a, a center that uh, has the names of all known or suspected terrorists, and there's, it's a large number because there are many aliases that people can use, and you can spell Mohammed 40 different ways, and, and literally, and so forth. But uh, we asked other countries if they wanted to give us their, the names of their known or suspected terrorists. Uh, and uh, a number of countries did. Russia immediately sent us 300 names, all Chechnyans. <laughs> Uh, just a, a little vignette, uh, so I, I don't know what, what was going on in the FBI's mind, but that was the first thing I thought of when I, when I read about it in the papers. But you're, you're quite right about hoping to have learned from our mistakes. Um, one of the issues, frankly, one of the learning experiences is the 215 program today, trying to have a, an ability for a period of five years to look back and see if there's something that we missed along the way. That's you know that's one of the, the things there, whether it's whether it survives or not I don't know, I have I have no idea but that's that is one of the learning lessons that we had at the time. Now, Carl, you you worked on these issues for a long time. Well, there's several things several things I think come to mind and I, I, I just if I could make maybe just three points on, on comments that were made. First of all, I I, I think we uh, we need to be cognizant. We need to recognize that it's, it's not just the role of the media when an event is playing out, but it is the, in fact, I think the legitimizing or even the, the magnifying role of the media uh, that is frequently sought by, the, uh, by the, the lone wolf terrorist or the small organization or the group, that, the, uh, that, that the, the act itself is done in order to maximize or gain recognition or, 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 or media attention. That becomes part and parcel with the objective of the, of the exercise. Um, you know, a, a terrorist act that falls in the middle of the forest and nobody's around doesn't doesn't really get you much at the end of the day. Um, so I think the media role is is a significant one and one that we that we still don't fully understand. I mean, the the urge to uh, to turn uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the Boston bombers into uh, well, the cover of the Rolling Stone. I mean, that right there that, that says that says so. Who would have guessed he'd be the first guy in his class? Um, second thing, I think we we. We are conscious of, and, and uh, Professor Kumar, I think all your points are right on the mark. Uh, however, we need to be cognizant also of the fact that uh, jihadi terrorism, Islamic terrorism, is only one, <laughs> regrettably, it's only one <coughs> thin slice of that of the continuum when we start looking at, at, at those people who, who we would characterize as the lone wolves. Uh, in fact, if you look back at American history over the last hundred years, we have time and time and time again of homegrown lone wolves who've gone out and done things like blown up the Los Angeles Times or blown up schools or, or carried out one act or another, blown up backpacks in the middle of Olympic Park in Atlanta. The, uh, none of that had anything to do with, with, uh, with, Islamic, with Islam, with jihad, uh, and it had precious little to do with anything other than their own particular bias, focus, or concern at that point in time. So, you know, it, it Regrettably, we're not in the position of the person of the guy who looks for who gets drunk and looks for his keys under the 
under the light on the street because that happens to be the, where the light is when he lost him in the alley. We have to be cognizant of that. And then, and then finally, um, one of the points I guess I would, I would make, and, and Spike, I would go back to it, I remain concerned, ambivalent, um, not terrifically happy uh, when I start hearing about things, how well they're collecting metadata and you have no rights to your metadata and your metadata is not protected. Um, the first question that, or the, the second question Yona asked was, can society survive? And the, qu the fair question to ask is, society can probably survive an almost limitless number of lone bomber type attacks. Uh, and if you don't believe that we can do it, I would simply suggest that you take a look at what happens in downtown Baghdad every day. The Iraqi nation continues to function after a fashion, and yet you cannot, you can, and, and if, that, if that level of carnage were playing out in the streets of the United States, I dare say we would all be hiding in our basements, or maybe not. Um, so the concern I guess I would have is if we are going to pursue perfect security, perfect protection, perfect detection, perfect uh, uh, maximize our ability to look at every click on the internet as a way of looking for that person who might be, might be an Islamic radical, might be a, a radical environmentalist, might be anti-abortion, might simply not like people with blonde hair, then we are, we are arguably, arguably um, we're not sliding down a slippery slope. We've got a toboggan, we've greased the skids, and we're headed for the bottom fast. Uh, I'd like to pile on there with a slight, slight twist to it. And this is a technology uh, angle to the whole thing. Uh, there have been, if you will, lone wolves or lone wolf packs, because it's usually more than, there's usually somebody helping on the side. Since mankind grouped together, crawled out of the caves, there's, uh, it's well documented that a certain percentage of us, one, two, three, four percent of any population or any society is just nuts. It goes postal and it's a gun and goes kills people. So whether it is motivated by ideology or whether it's just somebody going over the edge and getting a gun and killing a handful of people, it, it is part of uh, human nature. The question, however, is as technology provides tools to these terrorists or nuts to do harm, and as that technology gets better and better and more and more lethal and more and more available, the impact of those lone wolves or lone wolf packs grows exponentially. It used to be with just a few guns or a handful of even hand grenades, or even a panel truck full of fertilizer, you could kill dozens, maybe hundreds of people. One person can kill four, five, six, seven hundred people. Timothy McVeigh is one of the most successful lone wolves that we've had in a hundred years. He killed hundreds of people. But what's technology making available today? What's technology going to make available 20 years from now? What's technology going to make available to lone wolves 30, 40, 50 years from now? Already, gene sequencers are available on the internet. And people with the knowledge to sequence and grow almost unthinkable biological organisms are graduating daily. And uh, I have a PhD in biochemist upstairs who will tell you that it doesn't take but a bachelor's degree today to know how to get a gene sequencer and cause something, create something really bad. The point is that as technology builds the capability to do harm and our individual, there's individuals out there who will use that, when they get past finding a gun and start reaching towards biology or some other even more lethal technology, what will be the needs of society to make sure that doesn't happen? Today we can look at it and say, it's down in the noise. It's going to happen a few times a year. It's not worth sacrificing our civil liberties for. But if the potential grows to the point of almost certainty that sooner or later one of these knots is going to get a hold of something really lethal, then we might look at it differently and we might say it's worth sacrificing whatever we have to to make sure that a significant portion of our population, hundreds of thousands or millions, are not, uh, are not put in jeopardy. And do you know when we'll have that decision? Do you know when we'll have that discussion? We should be having it now about what our civil liberties are how we how we're going to deal with this we'll have the discussion about whether we need to find the nuts and the terrorists before they do it we'll have that discussion the day after one of them kills a million people and as Jonah is famous for saying it's not a question of if it's a question of when how much longer well, 
I, I, I certainly concur with you, you know, the, the thing is from, from our uh, academic studies for a long time, as you mentioned, human nature is the same. Uh, the first uh, lone wolf uh, attack took place in the Garden of Eden when we talk about Cain who okay, killed Abel and all that, but uh, seriously, it's, it's nothing is new under the sun except technology. And Kyle, you, you, spoke, you spoke specifically, you mentioned in the weapons mass destruction also the cyber, and I fully agree with you. Today, if I'm a lone wolf, and I'm really trying to bring society on its knees, I can kill hundreds of people exactly in order to derail, for example, trains or to try to, to uh, choke us, you know, with the electricity, uh, to, to uh, turn off electricity and so forth. The point I'm making is that tragically, we have to be vigilant as a society. Now I have my colleague, Professor Wallace. <coughs> Thank you, Yona. Well, I usually make closing remarks, and maybe I will, but this discussion, I think, is, um, raises profoundly the issue which principally uh, my neighbor, Mr. Olson, touched on. Um, you know, Yona, when you think of the sheer spectrum of events, when you think of Mike's point that they're going to be energetic, restless, violent, nutty, ingenious people, and you've got technology, let's assume something big is going to happen. My very intelligent English wife believes in safety, she's intelligent, and she wants society to protect itself. And I think the issue is really what Mr. Olson touched on. Um, I teach a course on, on this subject of you know, what the NSA is doing, um, and I think this will be the issue. Society's going to have to learn what the NSA, strike that. The NSA is trying to do more and more all the time. And why is it trying to do it? We have to assume that in good faith it wants to protect us. And it has technology of a different kind. So the issue really is, can society learn enough so that our political, I don't use the word leaders, but our political colleagues uh, can intelligently decide what to do? My students write papers about this all the time, about telephone, telephony, metadata, PRISM, et cetera, all these programs. There are constitutional issues. I agree with Spike. I'm, he knows much more about this than I. Maybe the metadata collection in and of itself doesn't constitute a search, say, under the Fourth Amendment, but I bet you the courts will be tempted to consider the individual queries. And the, and the NSA itself, you understand, is making quasi-probable cause determinations before it dips into my stuff. Although people point out, if you look at my travel records, uh, my doctors, all the stuff that's publicly available, you can know a lot about me already. That's the real issue. I mean, I think you're quite right. Uh, America will not want to lose its Fourth Amendment or First Amendment protections. We don't know enough about the facts, so as citizens we don't really know what our preferences should be. We will learn. I have seen no, uh, I've said this before, I have about as little tolerance for Edward Snowden as I have for the snake in the Garden of Eden. It will point out that Cain killed Abel outside the Garden of Eden. I've actually no respect for him whatsoever, none. He's an arrogant, self-important person. But ironically, he has raised these issues which for some reason our political intellectual leaders didn't. I can understand why. I think that is really what comes out of this because you'll never define lone wolves because there are as many lone wolves as there are wolves apparently. And uh, in fact, we want to keep wolves alive. Um, so I, I think that's really the issue. And it's interesting for Yona, who's a great authority on terrorism, who points out we've not yet defined it, although typically terrorism has meant political type action to intimidate others, get political results. It's hard to say that the Sandy Hook killer would fit into that or indeed Sirhan Sirhan, or maybe even Lee Oswald, or, or, or even Yadin. So I think we have to, more than focusing on definition, we've got to focus on this very, this plague of very unpleasant things, and just have to figure out how, so we have to focus, I think, very much on the coping, even maybe more than the kind of the definition and that kind of stuff. Um, I, have, I, have, I have a couple of uh, points in response to uh, Mike's statement now. Uh, firstly, given the resource constraints we have in a world of dwindling you know, financial resources, it's hard to monitor something when you don't know what the characteristics are, what the, what the typologies are, and what to monitor, what to look for. That's one constraint. 
And that's why there is so much talk about a risk-based uh, monitoring or risk-based security measure where you look at uh, vulnerability versus threat assessment. I mean, no one really has the single definition of risk as well, just as not having a definition of terrorism as well, or a lone wolf as well. So that's, that's, that's one constraint, really, when you, when you, when you look at that. And, and um, uh, in terms of uh, having a potential lone wolf having the means to perpetrate a terrorist act, uh, my my understanding and my take on this is it's not only having the means, it's having the environment, having the grievances, having triggering events, having inspiration uh, to do the kind of uh, acts that a lone wolf is, is capable of launching. So it's kind of an interplay between having the facility and, a, and the resolve to perpetrate something and having the conducive conditions and the environment to perpetrate it, uh, perpetrate it in, along with the external influences. Yeah, Karin? Um, I think I think these are all extremely salient points, and I, I think that there that there's uh, uh, there's a lot to be uh, uh, a lot to be taken from this. Let me just add, add however, that um, you know, I want to go back to to again your question number two: Can society survive? And um, I raised I raised Baghdad as a model of, of a society that somehow continues to function under the most horrific conditions, and certainly there are others around the world as well. Um, and the question has been raised, you know, can, could, what if that were happening here? The United States is arguably the most resilient society in the world. And yet we are probably one of the societies that is least willing to confront the issue of resilience in the face of actions like this. 9-11 did not destroy the United States. 9-11 was a, was a horrific event. The economic consequences probably got magnified because of our reaction. Uh, but nonetheless, but the event itself, and I say this with all due respect, I lost friends on 9-11 like many other people in this room did. 9-11 itself was a very small blip in terms of the American economy, the Amer American, uh, America's ability to, to do the things that America needs to do. And yet, it dominates every conversation we've had in the last decade for perfectly good reasons. Don's wife is British. Don's, Don's wife's uh, people, the Brits, survived the uh, survived the Blitz. They survived two world wars, which which reduced many of their cities to rubble. And they and they soldier on. What's what's the expression? They survived, they survived the Irish. They survived the Irish. Let's not forget that. Well, yeah, to the extent anybody survives the Irish. Um, <laughs> But the, uh, again, at the end of the day, as a nation, we need to be prepared to understand that all the efforts to go forward, whether, it, whether, whether it's, it's being able to effectively identify the, the, uh, the telltale signs of a, of a, of a, a proto-radicalization, proto whether it's being able to successfully dip into every, every, every internet search on the, on, the, on the web, whether it's being able to, to look for just to have the the ultimate filter of filters going through the metadata, things are going to happen. And, and the degree to which NSA and the FBI and our, our media and our politicians and others have defined our response to terrorism or our actions toward terrorism as being pursuit of a risk-free society, ensuring the prevention of any act. Okay, first of all, we set ourselves up for fail. Two, we, to fail, we've set ourselves, we've, we've created an unreasonable expectation on our population, and I would argue we've even done a disservice to the population of this nation by suggesting to them that somehow we can have this risk-free society or this risk-free free future and not pay prices. And not having that discussion about what those prices are, yeah, I have no respect for, for Richard Snowden, but I will say this, he's gotten the conversation on the table. Yes, please. Uh, one second, the mic is coming. My name is Steve Duncan. Uh, I'm going to follow up what Mike said with a couple of historical perspectives that I think may be useful. In 1936, uh, when Germany was building its air power as fast as it could, uh, there was a guy named Churchill who on the floor of the House of Commons was arguing, obviously, for increased defense spending. And the Chamberlain government said uh, uh, no. And the Prime Minister indeed got up and said, no, we shouldn't do that because we have no political mandate to raise defense spending and we can't afford it. Churchill got up by himself, not very popular at the time, and said, you know, <clears throat> we must remember that the protection of the British country 
uh, does not require a political mandate. It is the first order of duty of any British government. Now, with that in mind, when I was in the government prior to 9-11 in the Defense Department, I made an official visit to Israel. And I was meeting with all of their national security leaders, and I was most impressed with when I landed in Tel Aviv, the security. So I was talking to one individual, and he expressed the view, and it may have been a personal view, that when I asked the question, uh, what, what is your strategic approach to fighting terrorism, his answer was, well, we know we can't eliminate it, but uh, we hope that we can reach a point where it's politically acceptable in the number of events that have happened and the magnitude of those events. Well, I was thinking about that uh, a few years ago, and I thought, well, that was fine before 9-11 and when we were not thinking about weapons of mass destruction. But Mike's point about the technology. In my day, we had to worry about MIRV missiles on uh, Soviet warheads. But now, we're getting close to the point where you have to worry about one individual carrying a suitcase across an unprotected border. And if that's the case, you know, how do we get our political leadership to be honest with the American people instead of avoiding the discussion, be candid that we may have to pay a price, and a big price in our civil liberties, to do what the Constitution says, which is protect the American people as the first priority of government. And remember, it was the great emancipator, a guy named Lincoln, who suspended the writ of habeas corpus in the Civil War, and when asked about that after the war, he said, well, it might make sense to cut off a limb to save the body, but it would make no sense at all to kill the body in order to save the limb. We need a, we need a discussion along these lines because our political leaders, I think, are amiss in explaining to the American people that there's a real price to be paid, and as the technology advances, the price may get higher and higher. Remember, we didn't even have a right of privacy until Justice Douglas wrote an opinion in the 1970s. So, you know, while it may be firmly established now, uh, we have to take this in perspective of what's at stake here, and we need real political leadership, not ignoring the thing and leaving it to the people who have a vested interest, but we need political leaders to discuss this with the American people big time. 1965. Uh, <coughs> 1965. Any, Sorry. Any member of the panel? I, I would like again uh, to, to call our attention once again uh, that it's not only an issue for the United States. It is a global issue that affects uh, many other nations and uh, we mentioned uh, some of the democracies in Europe and Norway, in light of what had happened, uh, no, no one in Norway dreamt about this possibility of uh, massacre and, and so forth. And uh, I can report to you again from um, the conversations uh, we had just uh, several days ago in uh, Ankara uh, discussing the likelihood, the possibility uh, of a lone wolf attacking in the, some city in North Africa or in uh, Egypt. So again, it's not a question of if, but when, and where, and with what impact. And that's why I think it is critical to look at this not only on a national level, but also on the global level. We do have, Mike? Um, uh, another comment on the technology, because every time uh, we've had this discussion at a couple seminars like this at the Potomac Institute, We've also had it upstairs in our think tank, inside the think tank in, here at, uh, in Potomac Institute several times. And there's an issue of the technology that always comes up. And I'm a little actually always surprised that the general public doesn't realize this. And I want to point out that issue of the technology right here because I think it's important that the general public here, C-SPAN and across the nation, understands the capability to find outliers, if you will, to find lone wolves where that technology has already progressed to in the civil sector, the commercial sector, not in the government. The best example is in your in credit card behavior. If you take your credit card and try and take a dollar's worth of gas out and then immediately with that credit card go to the bank and try and withdraw all your money, that credit card will go dead because the credit card companies have built a profile of fraudulent behavior. They profiled it very well, and so the behavior of stolen cards is so well understood that the computers will manage it and your cards will go dead on the spot, or you'll have to call, call in and verify who you are. This has gone further. All your frequent buyer programs at Safeway, online, at Amazon, 
where you buy gas, all of that is computerized, all the metadata is available out there in the commercial world, and it's shared between those companies such that when you go to the supermarket and buy something and it prints out the uh, the certificates for you or discount cards, those cards are tailored for you because they've, they, they've been profiling you. If you go on Amazon and buy a bunch of books, the next time you go on Amazon, it recommends to you books exactly like the ones you bought before. This, is, this profiling is so sophisticated, one of our young interns gave, one of, gave me one of the best stories I've heard this year about this. It's a graduate student talking about a friend of his in college came in astounded. Uh, young married couple, his wife got pregnant, and before she had a chance to tell him that she was pregnant, he got an email from one of the one of the stores they shop at, recommending baby products for him. Congratulations <laughs> on you and your wife being uh, pregnant. They so well understood and profiled him and his wife that they were able to offer him discount before his wife could even tell him that she was pregnant. The commercial world is doing this metadata thing really well. Compare that to the fact that the, the, the guy who killed 21 children up in uh, the, the Northeast earlier this year, the guy who killed uh, uh, half a dozen people here in Washington a, a month and a half ago, they look back at their backgrounds, they stood out. All the neighbors said they stood out. Their behavior was profilable. So we can build profiles and so we can find these bad guys if we want to. I joke with the people upstairs Google, Amazon, Microsoft have built such good profiles of all of the people out there that if some radical went postal and killed one of my children, what couldn't I sue one of these companies and say, you had the ability to find them. You had the profiles. You had the ability to find them and to sue you for, for not helping us find them in there. The point of all of this is that technology's gotten to the point that if we want to find lone wolves, at least some of them, we probably could. Therefore, the question of whether we want to compromise our civil liberties is not an academic question. As it is a real question of whether, we, whether it's time to do that or not. Okay. <clears throat> Any other comments? Uh, Don, Professor Wallace, um, you always have the last word. Would you like to come up here and... No, I'll, I'll sit here. And I've okay. really, I pretty much said what I've said. My usual line is that Yona knows too much and he wants us to share it with him. It's very hard to pull together all the things that Jonah knows. And um, that's equal, it's especially the case with all these lone wolves. We're all kind of wolves in a way, you know, way back when. Um, I would say, that I just repeat what I said before, I've been whispering to, to Kyle. We're talking about America and, and the great society we think it is and how interesting our contemporary problems are, you know. I do think the issue is, as we've been saying, it's how do we cope? We, we do not want to be down at the level of Baghdad with all respect to any Iraqi in the room. You know, we, want, we want to survive with our values, and I would predict, and I'll put money on it, we will. But it's going to take hard work, and, and we'll work at it, and the courts, probably the FISA court has to be a little bit different in the future. Not at the metadata collection, but when you get down to the scoops, and they're not that many. Uh, at least if you can tell from the stories, there are about 500 queries a year when they dig down into the telephony metadata. I don't know about PRISM and all the other programs. It's, it's hard to, Spike Bowman probably knows all about it, and just because, not because he's read anything that's, you know, there's been any special briefing, he just knows, well, we don't. But I think we'll definitely make it, um, and there'll probably be some good business to be done along the way, so Mike will, some of that technology will be helpful, I think. Thank you. Okay, Mike, uh, maybe you want to close it? Uh. Uh, yes, uh, only with the comment that, uh, uh, these seminars are meant to be the beginning of the discussion, not the end of this discussion. So hopefully we've stimulated your thoughts and your desire to be involved more, and hopefully that will lead to greater involvement with, uh, with us and a greater help on your part in informing the public and keeping the discussion going. It's only through that process that we ever hopefully uh, resolve some of these issues. So thank you for coming. Thank you for your participation, and I hope you'll come back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here. Thank you.